Hi, thanks for joining the Achieving Business Value with AWS session. My name is Michael Chu, and I am in AWS Cloud Economics. What our team does is twofold. One, we work with prospective customers to help them understand and quantify the business value of migrating to AWS. And second, we also work with existing customers to quantify the value that they've realized and understand how to maximize that value on AWS. I'm going to be talking to you about achieving business value with Jake Burns. Hi everyone, I'm Jake Burns, Enterprise Strategist with AWS. I'm part of a group of XIT leaders that have used AWS to transition their organization, their enterprise to the cloud. And now uh, working for AWS, I get to share that experience with our current customers and share our lessons learned and help them be successful and more successful in their cloud journey. Formerly, I was head of cloud services at Live Nation Entertainment. We were able to migrate all of corporate IT to AWS in 17 months, and we had a lot of success and we realized a lot of benefits that we're going to talk about later in this presentation. In today's session, we're going to go through the cloud value framework and explain how you can think about quantifying the value of the cloud, dive into each area of the cloud value framework, cost savings, staff productivity, operational resilience, and business agility, and then lastly, cover some resources and best practices that you can use as you go back to your organizations. And sprinkled throughout, we will lean heavily on Jake's experience at Live Nation. This is the cloud value framework. This is a way for you to think about the value of the cloud. This framework is based off of hundreds of business case engagements that we've conducted with our customers. And it's based on areas of value that customers have both realized and quantified. In working with customers, the typical focus in initial migrations to the cloud are around cost savings alone. However, when we go back to customers and ask them where they realize value, customers speak to the things in the right. And those are really the more compelling benefits of the cloud. Cost savings is a TCO benefit of migrating to the cloud. A 2018 IDC study saw on average a 51% reduction in cost for the 27 customers that they interviewed. Staff productivity is the benefit of eliminating or reducing time spent on tasks that are no longer needed with the cloud. That same IDC study found that IT infrastructure staff were 62% more efficient after migrating to AWS. Operational resilience is the benefit of improved security and availability. A Nucleus research study followed 198 customers and found an average reduction in unplanned downtime of 32%. Business agility is the ability to respond faster to customers and innovate more. That IDC study found that of the total benefit customers realized in migrating to the cloud, 47% of that benefit was in the area of business agility. Amazon.com is able to deploy to production once every second, which allows us to be extremely responsive to customers and experiment rapidly. And if you look at the overall benefits, 8% of the benefit comes from cost savings, according to that 2018 IDC study, and 92% of the benefit came in the right three columns. So the takeaway here really is in building business cases, be comprehensive in your view of business value. Put those into the business case. Jake, how did Live Nation think about the value of the cloud? Are these four areas consistent with how you and your organization approached quantifying business value and building out the business case? Yeah, you know, it really started out like many organizations with a focus on cost. And that's, I think, very common. If you don't get the cost right, it's very hard to get far enough on the journey to kind of realize the other benefits. So we knew that and we focused very heavily on cost, especially early on, and we're very successful in that area. But we came to kind of the same conclusion that the real benefits are really in these other areas, specifically in agility. And I would also say that the productivity, resilience, and agility benefits feed kind of back into the cost savings. Because when you have a more productive staff, you're more efficient overall, and that contributes to cost savings. A lot of the ways that we were able to reduce our costs over time was directly related to the agility that AWS gave us. For example, being able to change instance types as often as we wanted to spin up and spin down infrastructure, to use auto scaling and all of those things ultimately reduced our costs. 
So I would say a lot of enterprises out there, they're focusing a lot on the cost and the cost savings are real, but the real benefits come from these, specifically from agility, but all of these areas. Thanks, Jake. And as I move to the next slide, what you'll see here is that this slide essentially echoes what Jake just said, which is that, I mean, these are examples of value realization across all industries, all workloads, all geographies. And customers, as Jake said, the customers are saving money with the cloud. And that will help you justify the migration alone. However, customers are also becoming more efficient. They're shifting from tactical to strategic work. They're also reducing risk and becoming more resilient. And as Jake mentioned, really the transformative value area here is business agility. And if you look at some of the examples here, right, third down, Aon Benfield, an insurance company, they've been able to reduce the time spent on risk assessment calculations from 10 days to 10 minutes. Bristol Myers Squibb, a pharmaceutical company, they're able to reduce the calculation time required for clinical simulations by 98%. And benefits like those are transformative to businesses, and that's really where the value of the cloud comes in. What you see on screen here is a sample anonymized output for a business case that I recently worked on. And first thing you'll see is that the business case here cuts across all four dimensions of value. You'll also notice that the value areas here have been dollarized across all dimensions. And what that does is it puts the business case into a common language that stakeholders across the organization can understand. And the benefit to building a comprehensive business case like this really are threefold. One, if you're thinking about migrating a workload onto AWS, building a business case like this before the migration helps you justify the investment that will be needed. Second, if you've already migrated to the cloud, a business case like this that looks backwards and projects forwards helps you explain the value that's been delivered to the organization. And lastly, when you build a business case like this and track progress over time, you get what you measure and that's really how you maximize the value that you can realize with AWS. Now, what I wanna do next is to dive into each of the four dimensions of value and I'll start with cost savings. When you think about the basic economics of the cloud, Let's look at infrastructure cost on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Typically, predicted demand will go up and to the right. Capital expenditures are added in a step function basis. So capacity is added in a way that follows this blue line. Now, actual demand is volatile and it'll look something like this purple line. And essentially everything below that blue line and above the purple line, anything below your actual capacity and above your actual demand, that's opportunity cost. That is where cost savings comes. The other thing to note is that typically, customers will provision anywhere between 20 to 50% over peak predicted demand for the period. Additionally, the National Resources Defense Council finds that average server utilizations range between 12 and 18%. And a recent McKinsey study found that over 30% of servers were utilized less than 10% of the time. And those industry averages are exactly why there is so much value to be realized from migrating to the cloud. Now, why do customers provision that far above peak predicted demand? Well, it's because when the purple line exceeds the blue line or your actual demand exceeds your capacity, well, that's slow servers, that's unresponsive applications, that's downtime possibly, that's unsatisfied customers, and ultimately it's lost revenue. Jake, what, what's your experience with on-prem utilization and over-provisioning? How was that like for you guys at Live Nation? For us, it was a big problem, just like for all organizations. And that's why the case for cloud and the case for AWS is so compelling. The ability to have that truly elastic capacity for your infrastructure allows you to get it right, get it 100% right, not over-provision, not under-provision. You can get it 100% right. And a lot of our cost savings, not all of it, but a lot of our cost savings are directly related to this. Yeah, the ability to better match supply with demand and that orange line matching that purple line. And the next thing I want to talk about is when we build a total cost of ownership analysis and we try to quantify out the first dimension of value cost savings, it's important to have a total cost of ownership view. That means you need to look at server storage and networking costs, and you have to look to the right. So for example, on server costs, it's not just the raw procurement cost of the server, 
it's all the hardware that comes associated with that. It's the server, it's the rack, it's the chassis, it's the PDU, it's the top of rack switch and maintenance on that hardware. It's also any software that you may have to install on those servers, operating systems, virtualization licenses, and maintenance on that software. And lastly, facilities costs. You have to consider space, rent, power, cooling. And additionally, I would say that one thing that I've commonly seen from customers is that that rightmost column and that bottommost row, those are areas where customers really struggle with quantifying. And it's because those costs typically are shared across business units and products and lines of business. And so they can be difficult not only to quantify, but also to allocate properly. That being said, even if it's hard to obtain or allocate, it still is important to put together an intelligent estimate of how much those costs would be and allocate them properly. Jake, how did Live Nation think about quantifying, allocating these costs, especially sort of those areas that are difficult to quantify? Did you guys struggle with that as well? Oh, yeah, we definitely did. And it's funny, you mentioned the facilities costs there, the space and power and cooling, those data center costs, because those were definitely shared. We had a lot of different companies under the Live Nation umbrella. And so when we're all sharing a data center, when it comes to allocating cost, somehow you add it all up, it never adds up to 100%. Everyone thinks they're going to claim they're using less than they're using. So it's really been possible to get an accurate picture, to be accurate with the allocations when you have shared resources like that. And there's a lot of bad side effects of that. And one that I witnessed a lot was because it was so hard to do the allocations, that we would stop sharing resources. And so there were a lot of instances where we would stand up hypervisor farms for a business unit, their own hypervisor farm or their own storage array, because it was really impossible to figure out who was using what on the shared resources. And so, you know, we're spending a lot of money to have all these little islands just so the cost allocation would work properly. Once we moved to AWS, then even before we implemented the fine granularity with tagging to get the real great reports, but even just separating them into separate accounts and getting the cost allocations done that way, which is a super easy way to do it. I mean, we were like 98% accurate with it. It was amazing. And so having that accurate allocation also created accountability. That accountability, because we were able to say who was using what and how much, was one of the major factors that allowed us to reduce our costs once in AWS. And I think that's a phenomenon that really isn't realized by a lot of people until after the fact, but it's very real. You create accountability and people will want to lower their costs because they know how much their infrastructure is costing. So night and day difference for us. Yeah, that's a great example about dedicated hypervisors when those groups don't necessarily need it just because the cost is didn't want to be shared. And I think that further goes to exacerbate the utilization issues that, that we just talked about. And um, what I like to do now is go through the AWS benchmarking insights as they relate to cost savings. Late last year, we surveyed 500 AWS customers and we asked them about their financial and operational performance on KPIs before and after AWS. And this specific KPI is IT infrastructure spend. Overall, you'll see that the 500 customers that we surveyed reduced their costs by average of 19%. And if you look at how that number changes over time, customers that have spent more than three years on AWS see their reduction in overall IT infrastructure spend increase to 22.4%. Those customers with a medium or high AWS footprint, meaning they had a significant percent of their overall infrastructure in AWS, saw an even greater reduction of 25.2%. And lastly, those customers that were exclusive to AWS saw the largest reduction in IT infrastructure spend. That number was at 29.1%, over 10% higher than the overall average. News Corp publicly stated that they've saved over $100 million in three years by moving to AWS. And this is a company with approximately 90 million in operating income. So you can see that their migration to AWS has had a tremendous impact. GE Oil & Gas, one of GE's first units to move to AWS saved 52%. This was one of the first business units to move to AWS. And GE overall is working to migrate over 9,000 workloads, 300 disparate ERP systems, and reducing its data center footprint from 34 to four. I wanna turn it over to Jake. Give us a background about your overall migration, how that went, sort of some context, and then specifically dive into costs saved on AWS. Sure. So 
we were under some pretty tight constraints from the beginning, which ended up being a good thing, uh, although we didn't think so at the time. So we, we had a challenge from our CEO to move 100% to AWS in 12 months. We had 118 applications, uh, 668 servers. That really affected our strategy. And what it ended up doing was it ended up making our strategy better, I would say, because we figured out how to do it. We figured out how to move quickly. And we also learned that the more quickly you move, the less expensive it is. And the quicker you can shut down your data center, the sooner you can stop paying for it. So moving fast is something that we learned is hugely beneficial. So the way we did that was we focused on training in the beginning, which I recommend. Take the AWS training classes, get your staff trained up because that's going to pay dividends because they'll be able to more intelligently do things and do them more quickly. So getting that training done in the beginning. And then we adopted a strategy of moving the low risk, easy stuff first. And the rationale behind that was to build momentum, which was very, very important because by the time we got to the more difficult things, some of the large databases and the ERP system, at that point, we knew what we were doing and there was a lot of confidence that we'd be able to do it. And so that strategy worked out really well for us. And it's evidenced by these metrics that you see here. We realized nearly 20% savings in total cost of ownership. That's day one after the last application was moved to AWS. And we further reduced that moving forward. We found that it was absolutely true that our costs go down over time in AWS. And for the very reason that the better you are at operating in the cloud, the lower you can get your costs. So we continued learning after the migration, and that allowed us to continue to drive our costs down over time. Thanks, Jake. Next, we'd like to move on to covering staff productivity, the second dimension of value. And as a reminder, staff productivity essentially is the benefit of eliminating or reducing time spent on tasks that are no longer needed with the cloud. Essentially, what happens is that tactical work drops, and that tactical work is able to be replaced with more strategic work. And typically what we see with customers is that that differential increases, less time is spent on tactical tasks and more time is spent on strategic tasks as higher level AWS services and managed services are adopted. And one quote that I love from the global CIO of GE that really emphasizes the thrust of staff productivity relates to how he wants his people to spend their time. And he says, quote, the things we are going to choose to buy are the things that don't differentiate us. And for us, that's where AWS comes into play. AWS is our trusted partner. I'm not going to sell another aircraft engine because I run global compute well. I'm not going to sell another locomotive because I figured out how to engineer a great user experience for my developers. I'm not going to sell another oil and gas pump or pig because I figured out how to do self-service and build IT infrastructure. And that, I think, summarizes the thrust you are able to reduce your time spent on undifferentiated work and allow your employees to focus on really what differentiates your business and helps you sell locomotives and oil and gas pumps and aircraft engines. Looking at the results from the AWS benchmark study as they relate to staff productivity, what we saw was that before and after AWS, there was a 2x increase in the number of virtual machines that could be managed per administrator on-prem versus with AWS. Similarly, we saw a 1.8x improvement in the number of terabytes that each storage administrator could manage on-prem versus in the cloud. And that is also compounded by the fact that the employees have to deal with fewer incidents. We saw an average of a 43.4% reduction in total incidents after migration to the cloud. Intuit's SVP of Platform and Services identified that over 60% of her team's time was spent on heavy lifting tasks. And part of the value with AWS is that now her employees are able to be focused on more differentiating tasks. AdRoll estimated that they would have needed at least 20 full-time engineers to effectively manage a physical environment if they weren't running on AWS. And these resources are now focused on developing and building out their core real-time bidding system. And I want to turn it over to Jake so he can talk about his experience with respect to staff productivity at Live Nation. And, and Jake, if you could quickly cover sort of how your staff were trained up on the cloud, I think that'll be of interest to our audience as well. Sure, Michael. You know, I love that GE quote, by the way. And, you know, while it's true at the company level, it's also true at the IT level as well. It, when, you, when we go through these things and we talk about how efficient everything is, a lot of IT people look at it and they, they're fearful because, you know, that's my job to do all that undifferentiated stuff. 
But what we found was we didn't reduce staff at all. In fact, we repurposed our staff and we did that through training. And so these people who might have just been like a data center operator or they might have been managing hardware or just doing very routine things in IT, after the training, they were repurposed as cloud engineers. And their job got a lot more exciting and they were able to provide a lot more value and they were able to be a lot more productive. Looking at those metrics on the previous slide, those 2x, our experience I think was more than that. Our productivity shot up and it wasn't productivity like how many servers we can manage that, that shot up also, but it was really how much work that was important to the business was getting done. It wasn't just IT work. It was developing projects to the business. It was developing applications to the business. It was allowing our business to try 20 things instead of trying two things. And they don't want to keep those 20 things, but they figure out what works and what doesn't work. And it makes the business more efficient. You just shut down the things that don't work. So you can do that. You could shut down anything at any time. You're not locked in by the hardware that you purchase. The, the, we utilized AWS's training. We actually brought the trainers to us. We did accelerated training program and the team got certified. And yeah, even today, if, if you look at Live Nation IT, there isn't an infrastructure team, there's a cloud team. And they're all AWS certified and they enjoy their jobs and they're providing a lot more value than they were. Thanks, Jake. Let's move on to the next area of the cloud value framework, operational resilience. And remember, operational resilience is the benefit of improved availability and security that comes with AWS. What you see on screen here are figures from industry analysts that speak to the cost of outages and the cost of downtime, the cost of data breaches, and the cost of getting records stolen. Now, these are large numbers, and the cost of downtime and security risks are extremely high, and the potential impact to your business is significant. While these events may not be frequent, when they do happen, the cost is very high. And so it's important to at least include this component into your business case. I have seen some customers who are uncomfortable with dollarizing these benefits, and so they leave these in terms of KPI benefits around, for example, availability. And that's a recommended approach if your organization is uncomfortable dollarizing these benefits. However, I think the takeaway here is that because the impact when these events do happen is very real and significant, it's important to at least include them in your business case. And, and Jake, on that, how, how does Live Nation think about quantifying the cost of downtime and the benefits of resilience? And is there a difference in the way you think about it for different types of applications? Yeah, and I think you're right. There is this hesitancy to quantify it. But, you know, anyone who works in IT knows when there is an incident, when there is an outage, it's all hands on deck. And when you have all hands on deck, you're not working on anything else. So it's a huge time sink and a lot of man hours go into addressing these things. And if you can eliminate them, you not only eliminate the outages and this disruption to your business, but you eliminate all the resources and all the money and all the man hours that you spend in addressing them. And so we did some analysis on this. For example, man hours spent addressing hardware failures went to zero after we went 100% into AWS. We had zero security incidents related to hardware or related to data center. The shared security model freed us from having to deal with more than half of the things that we had to worry about previously. And so it saved us a lot of money and it actually made the analysis easier because half of the layers were taken out of the equation and we didn't have to worry about them and it was secure and it was free from outages. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you're essentially reiterating our main takeaway here, which is even if something is difficult to dollarize, that's fine. Assign some KPI to it that you would track and measure over time, like some of the ones you just gave, and use those as proxies for benefits in this area. So that, that's fantastic. The next slide I want to talk to is, again, back to the benchmark study. When we asked those 500 AWS customers about their resilience before and after AWS, we saw significant improvements. On average, customers saw a 43.4% reduction in overall incidents, a 48.7% reduction in P1 and P0, and a 36.1% reduction in security incidents. And what further compounds that benefit is that there are fewer incidents to deal with, as you see in those three metrics, but when those incidents do happen, the MTTR on those incidents is also reduced. So not only are you seeing fewer incidents, when those incidents do occur, you spend less time resolving them. 
Now I want to go through several case studies as they relate to operational resilience. Travel Start was able to seize opportunities in emerging markets. They were able to cut their OPEX by 43% while reducing their downtime by over 25%. MedStar Health was able to rebuild its patient engagement platform on AWS, offering patients an effective way to search for doctors, services, and locations and make medical appointments. And at the same time, their downtime was reduced from 120 minutes to less than five minutes per month. And page download times decreased from an average of 1,500 milliseconds down to 120 milliseconds. And if you talk to them and you read their full case study, you'll see that the benefits really don't stop there and they're linked to other dimensions of value. Because of those benefits I just talked about with respect to resilience, they found that their customers were spending more time on their application and they were driving further engagement with respect to their patients on their platform. They were booking more appointments. They were talking to doctors more. They were finding more appointment times. So really, again, that's how business agility sort of links into resilience here. And I'd love to now turn it over to Jake to talk about how Live Nation thought about and quantified their benefits as they relate to operational resilience. Great points and kind of had a very similar experience to those examples. Um, you know, the shared security model, I was talking about that before, how we only have to focus on a subset of the things that we had to focus on before. And so it frees up our time. But a side benefit of that is we have those areas we are in charge of, we could do a better job in those areas. And, and those areas are application, performance, security. Our metrics show that our availability went up basically overnight for every application that we cut over. And another great point that you made applies to us as well things still do happen. It wasn't 100% availability, right? It was five nines. When they happened, we were able to resolve them so much more quickly. If we had an application crash, then we could spin up a new server immediately. You know, we didn't have to wait for hardware to be troubleshot. You know, if there was an actual hardware failure, we could have that migrated before a failure occurred. So it's definitely both of those things. We we're avoiding those issues, but when we did have some issues, we were able to recover from them very, very quickly. Um, you know, I, my favorite one on this on this list is, is zero performance complaints, and that's a result of the elastic capacity that AWS gave us. If we knew that there was going to be a spike, we could upsize. We could, we had auto scaling in place to have elasticity automated for us. And for us, storage performance was our real Achilles heel before, and the ability to change performance characteristics on our block storage with provision IOPS or EBS was just a game changer for us. So we knew ahead of time, a lot of times when there was going to be a peak and we needed to prepare for it, we were able to prepare for it. Whereas when we were locked in with hardware before, we were stuck with what we had. And, and for the things that did surprise us, that did catch us by surprise, we were able to resolve it very quickly. If we got a performance complaint before, it might have been, okay, we got to procure some new disks, some new spindles, and we, it's going to be weeks at the very least. We were able to resolve issues in real time in AWS. If anyone complained about performance, it got resolved immediately. So it was really a night and day difference for us. Yeah, and did you guys think about or quantify the cost of downtime and sort of what that availability improvement led to from a dollar's perspective? We didn't do that analysis, but we did track the availability. But I can't tell you how much we saved. I imagine it was quite a bit, but I don't have the dollar figure for you. Yeah, and just so the viewers know, we do have tools and models that help us quantify all of these dimensions of value that we're going through, and I'll cover them quickly on the resources slide at the end. But we do have, like I said, access to models that help us quantify and help us estimate some of these things, especially some of the areas that are difficult to quantify, like the cost of downtime. We have industry benchmarks that help us make an intelligent estimate at what that cost of downtime could be. So on to the last area of business value, which is business agility. As a reminder, this essentially is the ability to innovate more and respond faster. These KPIs that you see on screen are KPIs that our customers have told us have improved as a result of their migrations to AWS. Now, this is a long list and by no means is it comprehensive. The takeaway here is to pick the KPIs that are most relevant for your company and your workloads Ideally, have them aligned to companies' strategic priorities. Track a subset of them that fit those criteria. And then make sure you baseline where you are on those KPIs today. Set targets for where you would like to be on those metrics. And then track and measure those over time and report those back out. And that's really how you're going to realize the most value when it comes to business agility. You'll probably realize those benefits without doing any of the things I just talked about. 
but you'll realize more and achieve more value if you do that up front and track progress over time. The results of our benchmark study speak to this. We saw on average for those 500 customers an accelerated time to market of 18.8%. We also saw that on average customers were able to include more features and fixes per release as well as increase their application revenue per user. And I will say that when we think about quantifying this dimension of value, it's very application specific. Every application is going to be different and it's going to be dependent and so when we think about quantifying these specific areas of value, right, accelerated time to market, application revenue, you have to have an application specific lens when you think about quantifying this particular area of value. And, and Jake, quick question for you. How did you guys think about quantifying the value of business agility? This is a complicated subject, and, and I really like the tools that you guys are providing customers for this because I, I feel that enterprises in general don't necessarily have the time to do this type of analysis. We have our own priorities that we're busy with, but this is important because, like you said, if you measure it, you tend to do better at it. And you're going to get the benefit whether, you're, whether you realize it or not, but it's good to have the numbers and see it. So for us, it really kind of manifests itself in, in very simple metrics, like how many projects were we able to complete with a certain size team. And we kept the team sizes the same in our productivity in terms of what we delivered to the business skyrocketed. And then our metric and resiliency, you know, our outages became uh, almost non-existent uh, after adopting AWS. And, and our costs, our costs went down. That's very measurable, especially with AWS. You get your bill every month. You know what it is. It doesn't take a lot of work to figure out what things cost and why they cost what they cost. So you're able to measure these things a lot better and because of that you're able to control them a lot more and so those we just use those very simple things like staff productivity how many projects are we shipping how responsive are we how quickly are we resolving tickets how quickly are we getting projects done what is our availability metrics and what are our costs and that's what we're tracking and it, all of those things improved yeah thanks and that's a great segue to the next slide which is what are some examples of value realization in terms of business agility and you can see here that afg the australian finance group they were able to shift from 80 percent of their it expenditures being consumed by operational costs to a place today where they are able to spend over 60 percent of their it expenditure on innovation kellogg's is able to deploy instances 90 percent faster and autodesk is able to reduce the time of their projects from years to months by being able to provision more quickly with AWS. And one challenge that Jake just spoke to, which is, well, how do you think about quantifying and dollarizing these benefits? You know, I'll give you guys a good example. I recently worked with a media subscriber-based company where they had the choice of upgrading an application that affected their conversion rates on upgrade. So their consent messaging application oftentimes forced users who chose to upgrade services, forced users to wait in excess of several minutes. Now, if they were to have upgraded this on-prem solution, it would have taken six months. They chose instead to upgrade this application in a hybrid manner, upgrading that specific component with AWS, and they were able to do that in one month. So essentially, they had five months more where their conversion rates were much higher because the consent messaging delays went from several minutes down to five seconds. And as you guys can imagine, when your customers who have chosen to upgrade have to wait five minutes, there's a significant drop off in those conversion rates. So we were able to look at how many clicks were happening on a historical basis, look at the LTV or lifetime value of that upgrade, look at the five month period of additional time they had with that application, and quantify a very specific dollar benefit. Now again, as I mentioned, every application is different, but that's one example of how we can think about quantifying the benefit of improved time to market. And finally here on business agility, again, I'd love, love to just turn it over to Jake and sort of have him discuss how Live Nation thought about business agility. Yeah, this was the key one for us, you know, and it fed kind of into everything else here. One of the reasons why we're able to get our costs so low was the agility that we had with AWS platform, you know, the ability to experiment. It not only was able to drive our productivity in terms of delivering value, but we're able to also experiment in ways to save costs as well. And so agility gives you kind of superpowers 
to do everything. Uh, it just makes everything more efficient. It allows you to move much, much more quickly. You know, people who haven't done it, they don't believe you when you tell them, you know, it's a 10x improvement. It's not a 10%, it's a thousand percent improvement. But it really is because if you think about just some examples, you know, I want to see a different hardware configuration or a completely different architecture. I want to change the database tier and the, and the web tier and the storage tier, completely how it's architected. It, it never gets off the ground when you're dealing with you know, on-premise infrastructure because that's just, that could be a six-week project, could be a six-month project to just change it. In AWS, we got to a cadence where we were changing those things multiple times per day in test environments, and we were able to find out what the most efficient way to do it is. And I think that's where the real value is. You can, if you want to focus on cost, you can use that agility to drive your costs down. If you want to focus on resilience, if you want to shoot for 100% uptime, if you want to try to get that, let's how many how many nines can we get? You could focus on that. If you want to just develop more products, you could do that. If you want to do all of above, you could do that. So just the agility allows you to do whatever you want to do. And we did a lot of experimentation once we were in AWS because we realized that that was possible. And so it's just kind of changing that that mindset that you have, you know, working in IT for a couple decades, you start, you don't really realize you can do these things. But once you're in the cloud, you absolutely can do those things. And so it's really about wrapping your head around that and believing that and then changing the way that you operate. And Jake, talk about um, the, the, the cost of failure and how sort of that allows you to be more bold. The thing that kind of surprised us, and it's obvious in retrospect, is that the ability to shut things down causes you to be a lot more brave and a lot more bold in what you try. And so you end up trying a lot more than you would have before because you know if it doesn't work, I can just shut it off. I can just get rid of it or I can change it completely. And so people love to talk about, you know, if we oversize something or if we over-provision something, we can just downsize it and that's great. But what you learn over time when you're operating an AWS is that that's great, but not only that, but you can just try as many things as you want to try. And you can place what seem like big bets, but they're really small bets because the cost of failure is nothing. In a lot of cases, it's, it's a rounding error. And one of the greatest kind of end results of that is that in IT, what we did was we just started saying yes, where we were saying no most of the time to things because it was too expensive or because it would take too long. We just started saying yes to almost everything. And really, that's what the business needs from IT. They need enablers. They need people who are actually enabling the business to do business. And that's what eventually happened. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great summary. I mean, more projects into the top of the funnel, you get things through the funnel quicker. And if something needs to be shut down or it fails, shut it down and there's very little cost compared to the on-prem world where you had provisioned all this hardware and equipment and when you shut down something well now you got to figure out what to do with all that hardware right so um yeah thanks for that jake it's that's, that's a great absolutely story. And, and you know it also allows you to eliminate all the analysis that you used to do because the cost of failure was so high before you really had to be sure that you were doing the right thing but now what we found is we just skipped that. I eliminated POCs, for an example. We just didn't do uh, proof of concepts anymore for projects. We just do the project. We skipped an entire phase of every project because it was just unnecessary. We would go ahead and just start moving forward in production. And if it didn't work, we would get rid of it. And that's what I mean when I say being bold. We just say yes to things and we just do it. We skip the analysis. And ultimately, that's why the CEO came to us and said to do this. He had the foresight to see that, that that would happen. We were moving too slowly as an organization. IT was holding the organization back, as it is in a lot of enterprises. And by going to cloud, by adopting AWS, we were able to allow not just IT to be agile, but the whole business to be agile. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. And as you just pointed out, saying yes to more things, so more stuff in, but you also can push those projects through much quicker. So that, that's fantastic. And so in closing, what I want to do is just let the audience know about several resources to help everyone get started. The first is awstcocalculator.com. This is an online tool that will allow you to go in and estimate your costs on AWS. Second, there is the AWS Cloud Economics Center. 
And a lot of the research that I'm talking about today, along with that IDC study that I referenced, are available on the Cloud Economics Center at aws.amazon.com slash economics. And lastly, there on the very bottom, you can see there's that link to the Live Nation Value Realization Study. Now, Jake has talked to some of the things that he experienced in Live Nation's journey. If you're interested in reading the full white paper on that, just go to aws.amazon.com slash blogs slash media slash tag slash Live Nation. Thank you, everyone, for attending. If you have any questions, hopefully we've answered them during the session. If not, you could follow up with, um, with us afterwards. Thank you again for your time.